Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you for joining us online and being a part of our online community. We're continuing our series called Unshakable. And we're talking about building a foundation for an unshakable faith in God. Because we have times in life that we could describe them as storms. Anybody ever been through a storm? Anybody know what a storm is? I mean, you go through, we all go through storms. Um, in fact, some people believe that you're either in a storm or headed toward a storm. If you're not in a storm right now, just wait. There will be one that comes. And here's the thing about storms is they're normally unexpected. Nobody expected a pandemic to begin a year ago, and yet we find ourselves in the middle of a storm. So here's the question. How do you survive? How do you stay strong? How do you keep your faith? How do you keep from quitting? How do you keep from falling by the wayside? And building an unshakable faith in the middle of a storm. Well, the key is you don't wait till the storm happens to try to found, find a foundation. You begin building a foundation before the storm ever happens. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about some building blocks for your faith. And uh, the series that we're in right now really is about some just very foundational aspects of Christianity. And so if you'll get these things down, your faith is going to be unshakable. You'll be able to survive a storm. You'll be able to live and have faith and uh, keep your wits about you without losing your mind when bad things happen. And so uh, that's what we're talking about, uh, building an unshakable faith. And then we've been talking about, we started off with the Word of God. And the reason we started there, because the Word of God is where we find out about God and how to have a relationship with God and what he's like, how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Without the word of God, we don't really know those things. And so we started there. And then we talked about how to build an unshakable faith in God. We talked about some very uh, fundamental, rudimentary things about God and your relationship with God. Obviously, you cannot talk about everything about God in a single sermon. But today, we're gonna talk about something that everybody probably expects us to talk about, uh, in this series, we're going to talk about Jesus. And I love talking about Jesus. And I love that our church talks about Jesus a lot. We say at Avalon Church, we take Jesus very seriously, everything else not so much. And if, you're, if you come from one of those churches or you're one of those Christians that's offended over everything, everything that the news does or everything that a lost world says, which by the way, it's not unusual for sinners to talk like sinners. It's not unusual for non-Christians to talk like non-Christians. Do you know what I mean when I say that, okay? So when a, when a non-Christian talks like a non-Christian, it doesn't offend me. You know why? They're not a Christian, all right? And so we try not to be so easily offended. And so we're gonna take Jesus very seriously and everything else, not so much. And we can laugh at things. And some things that uh, Christians do, we can laugh at. Because, by the way, if you don't have a sense of humor, you'll go crazy anyway. And uh, to be honest, Christians do some funny things. You ever notice that? We do some funny things. We say some funny things. Uh, after you get saved, I don't know how this happens, but after, particularly when you become a pastor like me, the, the more you study and the more you get, get your education and the more experience you get, uh, the more funny things you say. And the more things you say that you just take for granted that, Lost people know, and they don't. That's why we say a lot of times when we talk about the Word of God, I'll explain that the Word of God is the Bible. Because you'd be surprised at how many people in our culture don't even know that. They're like, you know, what's the Word of God? God's Word, what does that mean? Is God talking out of heaven with uh, the voice of Charleston Heston? I know all of you young people, I just went over your head, you don't know who that is. Uh, but uh, he had the voice of God. Morgan Freeman, we'll go with Morgan Freeman. He's got the voice of God, right? And uh, I love his voice. Uh, but the fact is, the Word of God is simply the Bible. That's what we're talking about. And so we try to talk in a way that people understand. And today, we're going to try to talk about Jesus. Now, here's the thing. It's impossible to talk about everything about Jesus in a single message. And you and I can probably agree or disagree. There, there may be some things that I leave out today, and I left them out on purpose uh, because I had to edit it down. And there may be some things that I leave out that you think are more important, and that's okay. 
I'm not trying to say that these are the most important things. I'm just saying that these are three things that you need to know about Jesus. And that's what we're talking about today. Three things that you need to know about Jesus. And I hope that you will get these things down in your soul. It's going to help you when you understand who Jesus is. And you understand these things about him. And uh, there's no way to exhaust the subject of Jesus in one single message. You understand that? But we, I believe these things are very, very important for you to understand and to believe so that you can build your faith uh, in a way that it is unshakable. And I'm going to just go ahead and jump right in. Three things you need to know about Jesus. Here's the first thing you need to know. Jesus is God and man. Now, that's a very difficult concept to get your brain around sometimes. Um, just so I'm going to show off a little bit that I spent tens of thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars on my education. Um, I'm going to give you a word that I paid probably $10,000 to learn when I could have just looked it up in a dictionary for free. All right. I don't know how smart a uh, seminary is, but nevertheless, this is what is called. I want you to get ready for this because you're going to feel educated after I say this. The hypostatic union. Aren't you impressed? Everybody impressed? Let's give me a hand for saying that. Okay, will you do that? I'm just teasing, of course. Now, what is the hypostatic union? It's the, it's the union, the combination of Jesus being both God and man. That's, that's all it is. So Jesus is both God and man. Now, just so you understand, uh, there was a lot of controversy over this or a lot of argument over this uh, in the first uh, three or 400 years of the church. And it wasn't that uh, true Christianity doubted that Jesus was God and man, is that there were heretics that began to teach that Jesus was not actually, he was God, but he wasn't man. Or he's man, but he wasn't God. And that is a heresy. And the first thing you need to know about Jesus, this is the most important thing, in my opinion, that you need to know about Jesus, was that in the incarnation, when he, became, when he came to this world, he was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. He said, why is that important? Well, the reason that is important and the most important is because Jesus had to be both God and man in order to make the sacrifice for our sins. Let me explain that uh, just quickly so that you'll understand why I'm saying that. Uh, Jesus being both God and man was important because Jesus had to represent humanity. Adam in the book of Romans was referred to as the first Adam. And when Adam, and it was Adam and Eve both, but Adam was what was called the federal representative, the federal head of humanity. And all that means is that he was, he represented all of humanity. And when Adam sinned, the Bible says, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, therefore death passed upon all men, mankind, for all have sinned. And the reason that you're a sinner is not because you sin, okay? The reason you're a sinner is because Adam sinned and you inherited a sin nature. And that's why the Bible says you must be born again. In other words, you're dead spiritually. We're not alive to God. You are a soul, living soul. You are both uh, body, soul, and spirit, okay? And the spirit that you have is uh, spiritually separated from God. When you are born, you are not born in right relationship with God, though we believe that uh, children go to heaven. We're not uh, one of those groups that doesn't believe that Children go to heaven. We can prove that from the book of Romans and, and, and throughout Scripture. Uh, so God does not put children in hell, so don't think of that. Uh, but it is when we become responsible and aware of our sin that we become responsible for our own sin. And because that we are born separated from God, even with children who go to heaven, who are safe, even with children, they have a sin nature. And every mom knows this to be true. You do not have to teach a child how to lie. There are not lying lessons that are on the schedule for when your kid is 18 months old and you say, all right, Johnny, we're going to start, you know, we know you're starting to understand now. We're going to teach you how to lie. You don't have to do that. They know how. 
You don't have to teach them how to be selfish. You can have a child that has a pile, a stack of toys this high, and another child comes in with one single toy. And you know what toy your child wants? They want the single toy that their friend has, okay? We're born with a sin nature. We're born separated from God. And so therefore the Bible says you must be born again. That's in John chapter three. Now, the idea that Adam was the human representative of of mankind, and he was, Jesus was called the second Adam in the book of Romans. Now, why was that important? Because as a human being, there had to be a human being that lived out the perfect law of God. The Bible is very clear about this, that when you break the law, that you're breaking all of it. Just one, one commandment you break means that you're guilty of sin. And, and if you're thinking that you're going to go to heaven by being a good person or by keeping the Ten Commandments, I have some really bad news for you. You have broken every single commandment. You say, no, I have not. I've never murdered anybody. Well, when you begin to understand what the Bible means when it says thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder is what it means. Uh, but the root behind that is hatred. The root behind that is an unforgiving spirit. And every single one of us is guilty of that. Okay, at some point in our life, there's been someone that we hated, someone that we wished ill upon, someone that we just, you know, if it came down to it, we'd be like, you know, like the old saying that where I grew up in North Carolina, I wouldn't give that guy air in a jug. I wouldn't spit on that guy if he was on fire, right? You ever heard that? Well, that is the root sin that is behind murder. Now, not everybody that has that, everybody has those feelings, murders, we know that. But Jesus taught us that there was a higher standard uh, to the law so that you say, well, I've never committed adultery. Well, Jesus said, if you look at someone to lust after that person, you have committed adultery. And I'm sorry, uh, I know that a lot of times we talk about men looking and so forth, but women do the same thing. Sometimes it's by watching, you know, a movie a rom-com, okay? And I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with watching a romantic comedy, okay? Uh, but the idea is that many of you, ladies, if you'll be honest, you put yourself in that movie with that guy, okay? And you know what that's called? That's called adultery. You say, well, that is not wrong or sinful. That's what Jesus said, okay? That's all I'm saying. And the point is not to make you feel like a scumbag. The point is that every one of us, no matter how good we think we are, no matter how uh, moral we may be, we are sinners. We're born that way. We are spiritually dead. We spiritually don't have to be taught how to sin. We know how to do it. In fact, we're te- the older we get, the more we're tempted to do it, even if nobody teaches us about it. We are sinners and we're born separated from God. And Jesus had to be human so that he could die on a cross. You see, the, after, the truth is, Jesus fulfilled the law for us. The Bible tells us that Jesus kept every point of the law. He didn't sin, not even one time, not once. He never let a curse word slip by accident. He never hated anyone. He never had an evil thought. He never did an evil deed. He was perfect. And as the second Adam, the human representative of the human race, he was able to take the punishment for all of mankind. Now, why did he have to be human? Well, he had to represent us on the cross and he had to be the person that was the perfect person that was able to take the punishment for sin But he also had to be human because God, the Bible says, God is spirit and God cannot die. A spirit can't die. But as God in human form, the only possible way for redemption was for God himself to judge our sin by sacrificing his son. You say, well, that that doesn't make sense. Well, actually, it does when you think about it. The fact is, God would not be holy if he did not punish sin. 
God would not be holy if he let every murder go unpunished or unrealized or unrecognized. Every, um, every act of sexual um, misconduct, every act of sexual sin, every evil thought, everything that's ever been stolen, every person that ever had a, a rotten attitude, every person that was filled with hate. And we could go on listing sins, but here's the point. The only way that God could be holy was to punish that sin. Because if you, as a human being, had someone break into your home and murder your family, and this person was caught by the police, and he stood trial, and a judge looked at that person and said, you know what, we believe in mercy in this court. We believe in redemption in this court. What we're going to do for you is make sure that you go into some rehabilitation and some counseling, uh, but otherwise, we're not going to punish your sin, your crime. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that would be a good judge that would do that? Do you believe that would be a moral judge that did that? Of course you, you would not. You would be uh, up in arms. It would make national news, and people would be disgusted because that was an unrighteous judge. Well, God cannot be unrighteous. He's holy. And he is just. And the only way possible for him to pay for our sin was that the Son of God, in human form as our human representative, able to die on a cross, died on the cross. And the Bible says that sin was put upon him that he took on the sin of the world. And in that moment, in that moment that is a seminal moment, the greatest moment in the history, well, the second greatest moment in the history of the world, the greatest moment was after he died and he was put in a grave for three days and three nights and he got up out of that grave. That's the greatest moment in human history, the greatest act of love in human history. But understand this, God poured out all of his wrath on his son, Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, the son of the Trinity, the one single God that, uh, that is manifest in three forms, three uh, personages, if you will. God himself took sin upon him and he took our punishment and he took every bit of what we deserve to have, and he died on a cross for our sin. So the number one thing you need to know about Jesus is that he was both God and human. He was both God and human. Let me read you just a few verses that will show you this, and this is by no means exhaustive of the verses about the humanity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. John chapter one, verses one through five. In the beginning was the word. That is the Greek word logos. Jesus is the logos of God. And what does that mean? It just simply means that uh, as the word of God, when you think about what God does, what does God do most? He speaks. Jesus is the manifestation of that. He is the word of of God. He is the Logos of God. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the Word of God. Study Genesis chapter 1. What did God do on those six days of creation? He spoke and things happened. God is always speaking. He speaks through his word. He speaks through Jesus. He speaks to us through our conscious. God speaks through nature. God is a uh, communicating God. Jesus is the Word. And the Word was with God, in case you were wondering. And the Word was God. So Jesus was God in the beginning. Jesus did not begin to exist when he was born in human form. He existed as God in eternity past. Okay? And notice, he was in the beginning with God. He's, he's kind of reiterating this so you'll get it. He was there in the beginning. He was God. He was there in the beginning with God. He was God. Uh, he did what God said. Uh, he is the word of God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
in him was life. You want to know how animals all the way down to one cell, amoebas, have life? It's because of Jesus. In him was life. Without a supernatural act, there is no life. Now, life began and it continues as people procreate and animals uh, procreate. Yes, that's true. Uh, but the truth of the matter is life, all life began with Jesus. In him was life and the life was the light of men. In case you're wondering how that light came, it came through Jesus when he came to this world and became human. And notice this, the light shines in the darkness. You see, nobody ever says, turn down the dark. They say, turn on the light. Because darkness cannot overcome light. It cannot. And Jesus is the light, and he is the life. And that, now, I want you to see this last phrase. And the darkness has not overcome it. He's the light. He's the life. And the darkness has not overcome it. There are times when you and I are living with darkness surrounding us, it seems. There are times when we are so depressed, so discouraged, that the only way we can describe it is darkness. You ever been there? If you haven't, you need to have compassion on those that have. And I'm not suggesting that you don't need to go see a doctor or a psychologist or a, or a counselor. And I'm not suggesting you don't need to take your medicine if that's what gets prescribed to you. But I want you to see what it said in that last phrase. The darkness has not overcome the light. And it cannot. No matter what darkness you feel, you may feel that you are financially in a dark pit, in a hole because you've lost your job. Or maybe your business has just been destroyed because of the last year of COVID-19. Or maybe you've been laid off. Or maybe you're struggling financially. Or maybe your debt is just crippling you. The darkness cannot overcome the light. That's what the Bible says. Jesus is the light. You may feel like your husband has walked out on you and he has left you holding the bag and you have these children to raise by yourself. You're financially crushed and you just feel like you're in a dark place. And no matter what your darkness is, I just want you to know, Jesus is the light and Jesus has overcome it. And we can trust in him. I'm not suggesting you don't need to go to the doctor if you're sick. I'm not sit suggesting you don't need to see a counselor if you're discouraged or depressed. I'm not suggesting that you uh, don't try to get a job if you've lost yours. I'm simply saying that Jesus is the light and the life, and you can trust him. Listen to Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Can you imagine what he gave up? The ability to be everywhere at the same time. I'm kind of looking forward to getting my resurrection body after Jesus comes back or after I die and Jesus comes back and I get to enter into glory, enter into heaven. And, you know, a lot of people say a lot of things about heaven. You know, well, there must be, you know, there's going to be, you know, fried chicken there because it's so good or whatever, you know. And, um, my, my grandpa's sugar-cured country ham surely must be there. Uh, or homemade ice cream surely must be there. Surely, right? Chick-fil-A, I believe that has been given from heaven by God, and it is the gospel bird. And so, uh, nevertheless, uh, that's probably a bit of nonsense about heaven. But here's what we know. Jesus is there. It is the abode of God. And when we enter into that place, we are going to have privileges that we don't have now. You're going to have a body like you don't have now. You, you ever read about Jesus that he suddenly was, he would suddenly appear after his resurrection. He suddenly appeared into a room. You ever think about the ascension back to heaven? You know, they kind of watched him for a while. But you know, if we want to talk about where heaven is and it's the abode of God and maybe it's outside of this universe, that's billions of light years. If Jesus is just kind of ascending it slowly, you know, no, you know what, he got out of sight, but then at the speed of thought, 
you're able to be somewhere. That's a resurrected body. Resurrected body is not going to be sick. It's not going to have pain. Uh, you're not going to have to worry about things. You're still going to be able to eat, but you're not going to get fat. That's going to be awesome, isn't it? I mean, you can eat whatever you want. and not your, your wife, if she's in heaven with you, listen to me, she's not going to get on to you about your cholesterol. You know why? You're going to be in a resurrected body that is going to live forever, and it's never going to have any pain. It's never going to experience sorrow. It's never going to experience anything bad. It is going to be a resurrected body. So think about the privileges that Jesus laid aside when he became human. He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. John 15, 18. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his father, thereby making himself equal with God. Don't you believe nonsense of people that say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God? Yeah, he did. That's the reason they killed him. They wouldn't have killed him otherwise. Listen to uh, John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. Now, don't tell me he's not claiming to be God. Of course he is. And Colossians 1, 15, uh, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So the first thing you need to know about Jesus is this. He is both God and man. Second thing I think that you need to know about Jesus and why this is important is that Jesus is virgin born. The virgin birth of Christ is incredibly important. Why is that important? Because once again, going back uh, to Genesis and Adam, the Bible says that uh, all people born from Adam, in other words, born in a natural way with a human father, the seed comes from the father. Uh, anyone born of a human father is going to inherit Adam's nature. And so if Jesus was born of a human father, he would have inherited Adam's nature and would therefore be a sinner by definition. But Jesus is not a sinner. He's God in human form. And so when Jesus was born, he was not born of a human father, but rather he was born of the Holy Spirit. And this was prophesied in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us, which is the whole point of Jesus' existence as a human being. Because not only is he God now, he's still human. You ever think about that? That he's God with all of his privileges. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's the, the second person of the Trinity. But he's human. And you know why he did that? I get kind of choked up when I think about this. He did it for us kind of hard for me to grasp who God is. I mean, I, I, I read and I study and I believe and I have faith and I, I understand. But you know, I can, I can sure relate to Jesus a whole lot better. And if, if we're standing before God, I think we relate to Jesus a whole lot better if he's human. Because when we stand before God, we're standing before the righteous, holy loving God of the universe, the perfect one. And the Bible tells us that when he looks at us, those that have put their faith in Jesus, that our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. You can go north only so far on a globe and it starts to go south again. But you know, you can go east or west with infinity. You start going west, and you always go west. You start going east, and you can go east forever. As far as infinity from infinity, God has removed our transgressions, our sins from us. What does that mean? God's forgiven you. That's what it means. And when God looks at you, he does not see your sin. This is called justification. And the reason you go to heaven is not just because you put your faith in Jesus. You put your faith in Jesus and what that causes in your life as far as the Heavenly Father is concerned is justification. And that means in a simple way that it 
puts you in the, in the place that it's just like you have never sinned. Not just like you have never sinned, but that you can never possibly ever even sin. And what God sees when he looks at you as a believer is not that you looked at porn last week or that you lost your temper with your spouse last week or that you thought about maybe stealing something from your job last week or that you thought about ramming the little old lady in front of you uh, in her bumper because she would not get out of your way when you're busy and trying to get somewhere. God doesn't see that. You know what he sees? He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Do you sin after you're saved? Of course. Anybody that says they don't is a liar or completely, completely deceived, okay? I know I still sin, But the Heavenly Father has forgiven me, and through the blood of Jesus Christ, I am redeemed. I, to use Bible terminology, am born again. My spirit has been made alive to the Father, and I am now in right standing, and because of Jesus. The Bible calls the devil lots of things. One of the things it calls the devil is that he is the accuser of the brethren, in other words, of Christians. He accuses us. And I can imagine that standing before God, you know, in Isaiah and in other places in the Old Testament, it gives us a picture of, the, of what it's going to be like when we stand before God. And it's going to look like a courtroom. There are going to be, there are going to be witnesses there. There are going to be elders there. there it's going to be like a courtroom. And I love it in Isaiah when it says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Because in the context of that, it's talking about you standing before God and being accused by the accuser. And I can imagine that when I stand before God, the accuser is going to bring up some things that I don't want anybody to know that I did. That I would be embarrassed for you to know. If you knew about me, you'd probably say, I don't want him to be our pastor anymore. Not not recently, okay, I'm just saying, you know. But there have been so many things that I would be so embarrassed about that I've done wrong. And I'm sure the accuser is going to say, well, look at this. And he claims to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And look at how he talked. And look at what he did. And look at what he said. And look at how he acted. And the Bible tells us in that grand courtroom that Jesus is our advocate. It's actually a a legal term. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer. And he's not just our lawyer, but he is also our go-between. And he is the one that says, you know what? We don't have any record of that because all I see is the blood of Jesus Christ that washes the sins away. You need to know that Jesus was born of a virgin. Why? Because it keeps him from being human. Not from being human, but having a a spirit uh, that was um, passed down by Adam. And it's so you and I can be saved. Let me just read a couple passages. Matthew 1, 18 through 25 about the birth of Jesus. And I'm running out of time, so let me just kind of Get, you know, get do this in a condensed version. It was that uh, Mary was found pregnant and Joseph was getting ready to put her away. He thought that she had cheated on him and she did not. She was a virgin. They were betrothed to be married. They were not actually married yet. And the Bible tells us that an angel of the Lord came to Joseph and said, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't worry. What has happened to Mary is that she is conceived from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave her the seed of the Son of God. And as a result of that, he was able to be both human, because he was born of a woman, but he was also divine. He did not inherit the nature of Adam. Galatians 4, verse 4, it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. And in that context, it's given the idea that born of just a woman. 
Now we know that physically that's impossible outside of a miracle. And so the miracle of the virgin birth. Genesis 3.15, I love this one. And I will put enmity between uh, you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Notice that uh, her seed is capitalized. It's capitalized. The context of this was the fall. Adam and Eve had sinned. God asked Adam, where are you, Adam? And he began to make excuses for his sin. He said, the woman you gave me caused me to do this. The woman said it was the serpent, which we know represents Satan himself. And so he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, talking about that there was going to be a seed of the woman. And we all know that it is impossible for a woman to have seed. Seed comes from the man. Eggs come from the woman. But thankfully, he was talking about Jesus between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel and, and uh, I like it in the old King James it said uh, he will crush your head and the fact is that Jesus Christ at that moment at Calvary when he died on the cross and one of his last words were it is finished he had finished what was necessary for the redemption of mankind and so Jesus was born of a virgin so that we could be saved. And then here's the last thing, and I think it's an important thing that you know about Jesus. Um, if you get a chance to read C.S. Lewis, I hope you'll do it. It's one of the great writers of generations past, uh, one of the greatest Christian writers ever. Uh, but C.S. Lewis, in one of his books, said, let's do away with this nonsense about calling Jesus a good person or a good teacher. And he said, and I'm summarizing what he said, he said, that's nonsense. He said, a person that claims to be God is either completely insane. We know people in our lifetime that have claimed to be God. They've made the news. They had a cult. And oftentimes they end up going up in flames. We see a person like that. We say, well, that's a lunatic. That's not God. So Jesus at claiming to be God was either, if he was not the son of God, then he was a lunatic. And, and he was as crazy as you could possibly be. Or, if he was not a lunatic, he would be an evil, evil person. Anybody claiming to be God and trying to manipulate followers like that would be evil. So either he is God or he's an evil person or a lunatic. And nobody in history would say that about Jesus. And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. And as such, He is the way of salvation. That's the third thing I want you to see. Jesus is the way of salvation. He's the only way of salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 10, 9 and 10 and verse 13, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, the greatest thing about Jesus is that he saves. Jesus saves. I look back in my own life, in my own family, and if it were not for the fact that Jesus saves, our family would have fallen apart. We would not be where we are. We would be in such a deep hole and such trouble. But thank God, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And friend, no matter how far you may feel from God, I want you to know this. You have not gone too far for Jesus to save you. No matter how you may feel that you have sinned so deeply and so, so completely, I assure you, you are not out from under the reach of the love of God. In fact, Jesus said, someone asked him, and he said, you know what? I came to save sinners. I didn't come to save those that think they're righteous, those that think that they're good. Oh, I came to save sinners. And friend, 
If you've ever sinned, if you would look at yourself in the mirror and be honest and say, you know what? Apart from Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. Apart from him, there's no hope. If you'll look at yourself and say, I have sinned and admit that, then guess what? Jesus said, you are exactly who he came to save. Doesn't matter if you grew up in church or not. Doesn't matter if you've lived a moral life or not. Doesn't matter if you've been a good person or not. God wants you to know that Jesus saves and he'll save you. And all you gotta do is what Paul wrote about in the book of Romans, one of the most brilliant pieces of literature ever written in the history of the world. And it's holy scripture. But Paul, in his brilliant treatise on salvation and Christianity, said, you know, if you'll believe in your heart and you'll confess with your mouth, that's just confessing with faith. That's letting somebody know about it. But if you'll believe that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, what do I need to do to be saved? i tell you what the Bible says. Call on the name of the Lord. Call on Jesus. Ask, and he will answer your prayer. And he will save you, just like the old song that Billy Graham used to use in all of his crusades, just as I am. You see, he saves the wicked. He saves those that have done so many things that they don't want anybody to know about them. I've got family members like this. I've got family members that have almost murdered family members. I've got family members that uh, if we were to have a crazy meter of 1 to 10, they'd measure a 12. You've probably got family members like that. I've got some wicked, wicked, wicked people in my family. And if I have to be honest, I mean, you know, the fact is, I've done some things that uh, would be God would identify as wicked, okay? But the good news is that Jesus died for them. He died for the wicked. And he'll die, he died not just for the, those that know that they're wicked, but those that think that they're good. My grandmother, for many years, she said that she was a good person. And she knew that she was going to go to heaven because she had been good all of her life. It was not until my dad had started a church and my dad said, Mama, I want you to start coming to my church. And she did. And after she had been going to my dad's church for just a few years, at age 70, age 70, my grandmother came down the aisle of that church during an invitation one Sunday and said, I confess Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord today, and He has forgiven me and saved me. And that moment, that woman that thought she was so righteous, and if you knew her, you knew that she was not righteous because she was mean as hell. I'm not kidding. She really was. But when that woman got saved, there was such a major change in a 70-year-old moral woman a 70-year-old woman who's a complete life and attitude and outlook on life had changed. Why? Because Jesus saves. That's why. And if you're watching online, I want you to know that Jesus will save you. If you're listening in the room, I want you to know that Jesus will save you. All you must do is say something like this. Call on the name of the Lord. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. I believe you're the Son of God. And I'm asking you to save me right now. Forgive me. Give me new life spiritually. Make me right with the Father. Thank you for saving me. God promised if you'll pray a prayer or say something like that, that he would save you. For those online, please click that, that you prayed to receive Christ, that you got saved. Click that little button today to let us know how to help you take your next step. If you're in the room today and you did that, you prayed that prayer, here's what I want you to do. Uh, the Bible is very clear that it, when it, it, did you notice that it said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but it also said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You see, that is an act of faith. Faith is not faith without some action behind it. You can say, oh, I'm so happy for Jesus and all you want. But until there is a confession of faith, that's really what baptism is. Until there's a confession of faith, then you're not saved. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And so today, if you pray to receive Christ, don't be ashamed. 
Fill out that next step card. Fill out that, click that button online. Let us know that you got saved today. Maybe today, the great need that you have is to know more about Jesus or to love Him more. You know, I want to love Him more every day. I don't always do it. Sometimes I think I love Him less than the day before because of what I did. But I want you to know that you can love Him. And your great passion in life can be to know Jesus. Because remember, we talked about this. The darkness cannot overcome the light. The darkness cannot overcome the light. And there's nothing in your life that can overcome your relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, maybe the rest of the crowd would join me and say, you know what? My prayer is, I want to know Him more. I want to love Him more. If that's your prayer, would you raise your hand? Anybody in the room today? Can I get a witness here today? Can I get somebody that's happy about the fact that Jesus loves us today? Those of you watching online can do a dance in your pajamas because I know you're wearing them uh, because you didn't get ready this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to know Jesus better. God, help us to lift up the name of Jesus in this church. Help us to make a big deal about Jesus. Help us to love you with all of our heart. And God, we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.